NFT is a big game changer. It onboarded a whole different set of users who may not be interested in financial applications. Crypto guys are libertarians. You got the financial guys coming in, and now like you have the artists coming in. Reddit have onboarded one million users onto Web3 without anybody knowing them. Where will the next billion crypto users come from? It will probably come through one of a very addictive game. Most of them are failing, but at some point, somebody's gonna make it right and go big. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Next Billion podcast, where we're talking to the entrepreneurs, the builders, the people that are making it happen, building products for the next billion people in crypto. And I'm joined today with an old friend of mine and someone who you might know from this brand right up here, Bobby from CoinGecko. Bobby, it's a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure to be on this podcast. Of course, of course. Well, look, I'm excited to hear about what's going on in, in Gecko land and, and all that sort of stuff. But maybe first, it would be really good to hear about the entrepreneurial journey because you've been an entrepreneur in crypto for how many years now? Nine years. Nine years. Okay. Long time. Long time, right? yeah. And also, CoinGecko is just the essential thing in crypto. I mean, I use CoinGecko probably every day, something like that. I'm sure a lot of people do as well out there. But uh, maybe tell us about how did things get started? Like, uh, what happened on day one when you're like, hey, this crypto thing is something that I should do and... What happens next? Yeah, so a bit of a background, I've got a degree in economics from UCL in the UK. And um, shortly after graduating in 2012, I was teaching myself how to code and I was spending a lot of time in tech forums and one of them being Hacker News. And I saw quite a lot of chatter about this new form of money called Bitcoin. Right. Having just spent my university life learning what I thought is everything to do with money. Yeah. I thought I know everything. So um, <laughs> there's a group of visionaries in the US instead of in Silicon Valley talking about new form of money. So I thought like, all right, either this guy's onto something mm. and my degree is obsolete, mm -hmm. or these guys are just don't know what they're talking about. I didn't want to be obsolete yeah. uh, coming out of uni. So I thought like the least I could do is to at least read the Bitcoin white paper and yeah. try to see if these guys are up to something. Read the Bitcoin white paper, decided that the best thing to do is to buy some Bitcoin and see if I actually have full control of my money, self-sovereign money. Because yeah. I've read a lot of horror stories about people having funds frozen in PayPal. Right. And, when, uh, when is this? This is early. This is in 2013. 2013. Okay. Yeah. That's early days. There's, yeah. there's not that many places to buy Bitcoin. Right yeah. Now. So my first Bitcoin was bought on local Bitcoins, which yeah. unfortunately just shut down. Yeah. So I had oh, some extra money in my UK bank account. I thought like, okay. I mean, this is money that I'm back in Malaysia by then. So I thought yeah. like money that is stuck in a different country anyway. So like I just try and buy some Bitcoin from some random stranger in the UK and let's see if the Bitcoin shows up. So basically there was like an eBay kind of want to sell Bitcoin ad on local Bitcoins. I just replied to him and said, okay, I want to buy X number of Bitcoin. And I like say, oh, sure, transfer this to this bank account. It's a random so account, like, yeah. All right, let me send it over and let's see if, if the Bitcoin shows up. It shows up after a couple of days and then like, Transfer it to a self custodial wallet. Uh, yeah, I think it's a blockchain.com or Electrum wallet. I think. Yeah. Well, the money is there. It's there. I have full control of this money. Uh, and then you're like, wow, okay, this thing exists. This these, thing exists. These coins are real. <laughs> I have full control. No one can take it away from me. Yeah. Uh, the government can't freeze it. Yeah. Whenever they want to. So that was quite a big revelation to me. And then I guess I went deep into what's next besides Bitcoin, kind of look into it, uh, read a bunch of white papers. There was the BitShares white paper, which talk a lot about the DAO, DAOs yeah. and what are all the DeFi applications. Basically everything. Well, that's amazing that, that you were yeah. like BitShares. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this was before Ethereum and then Ethereum yep. came out and kind of wrote the yellow paper and then kind of like incorporated a lot of the vision and the ideas behind BitShares in their white paper. And what we're seeing today was kind of encapsulated in that piece of like paper nine years ago. Yeah. I thought that if, okay, if this vision plays out, then this industry is something that we'll see very high growth. And I was too young to take full advantage of the tech innovation, the tech cycle. And then I had to be in Silicon Valley to actually take full advantage of it. And I thought like, this is probably a chance where I could, I don't want to miss this opportunity. So kind of basically search around for ideas on what I can contribute in this blockchain space, the crypto space. That was quite early. Like I remember BitShares, they had the first stable coin that was kind of like DAO. Yeah. They had the BitUSD and I think a lot of <laughs> what happened with, uh, with DAI was uh, what they mm -hmm. had sort of pioneered as well. So yep. I guess back then, you know, people were talking about smart contracts perhaps yep, or yep. like 
things other than just a coin. Yeah. And was that something which was perhaps interesting to you? Like, oh, there's going to be all of these other different crazy crypto things that are going to exist. Yeah, I think I think people were trying to build things on top of Bitcoin. So I think there was Master Coin, oh, if yeah. you remember, and then Colored the, Coins as well. Colored Coin, and yeah. many people don't realize this. Like the original version of Tether wasn't issued on Ethereum. It was issue on this Omni network. Yeah, Omni. So yep. on yep. top of Bitcoin. And um, it was kind of a hack, hacky way of issuing tokens on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Wasn't the best yeah. solution to it. But I mean, it does the job. And you know what? Actually, I was looking at that Nostra thing the other day, the Bitcoin. It's like some sort of social media thing. I think that's the thing that Jack is now yeah. going to do from Twitter. But that's pretty much working in exactly the same way that color coins did. Because it's like they put a, a thing in the the op return statement mm-hmm. of Bitcoin and yeah, that's how they make a thing. But yeah, it's crazy. Like some of these ideas come like full cycle, right? Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Okay, so you bought some Bitcoin, you were reading some of these other things that were going on in the space, and then what? You're like, man, I need to go and start a company that's that's <laughs> doing something with this, right? Or- I mean, I think at the start it was just mainly two things, right? How do you have self sovereign money, like money that no government can take away from you? Hundred percent. The second thing was also, this was on the backdrop of the financial crisis. So I spent my university days learning about the global financial crisis 2000. I learned a lot about this macro and learned about how bank runs work and yep. a lot of things were kind of obsolete. I, was, I remember learning about how my lecturer was saying there's a zero limit bound, meaning the interest rates can't go below zero yeah, percent. Right. That's, how did that's, that work that's BS, right? <laughs> like we've seen negative interest rates. Yeah. But I think this was on the backdrop of quantitative easing and yeah. the gov- central banks were printing money like crazy trillions of dollars and then well fast forward we now know that central banks kept on printing money for the next 10 years yep i thought back in 2013 that this wasn't very sustainable like if you keep printing money non-stop like things will eventually break and that's kind of what we are seeing right now yeah and bitcoin serves a very interesting monetary policy in the sense that it has a maximum cap of 21 million coins you know yep. the supplies you know, you can't inflate your way out of a problem and uh, everybody knows the rules. You can't just change the rules arbitrarily anytime you want. You can't just wake up and just set interest rates to go up or go down. Yeah, it's not just some guys sitting around a table once a quarter that yeah. decide stuff. Like, yeah, so that was interesting to me. The monetary policy was very interesting to me from my background learning economics mm. in uni. So that was it. And yeah, so basically I was searching around for ideas and basically networking, going for Bitcoin meetups. I uh, kind of had a chance opportunity to meet my co-founder TM in Singapore. And I guess when TM came back to Malaysia in 2013, I'd say, 2013, 2014, somewhere around there, yeah. We were brainstorming on a few different ideas on what we can do in the crypto space because TM's also very interested. He mm. saw the opportunity as well. He was building a Bitcoin sort of a small project, like a gum root for crypto. Mm. And I was doing some newsletter highlighting all the news in the crypto community. There was a time when I could actually read every single news in crypto space. Yeah, you can't do that now. <laughs> can't do that these days. <laughs> um, so we were discussing a few different ideas and on what we can do. And then the most obvious thing to do back then was to start a fiat crypto exchange. Yes. Everybody wants to do that. Yep. And uh, we thought that that's an interesting idea, very profitable, but I don't think we have the expertise. And we don't really want to deal with like, you know, getting bank accounts, mm. doing KYC, and then constantly being under attack by hackers trying to drain our funds. That doesn't sound very fun. That so, was a wise decision perhaps to, yeah. to not do that because, yeah, starting an exchange, it's not easy, right? You have a lot of experience, you kind of. Yeah, to well. To some I, extent. But, I got some, some experience yeah. in that for sure. Like, and I think that was, because a lot of people didn't think that way, yeah. right? A lot of people were like, oh, crypto equals buying coins on an exchange. And if you had a crypto company, it was all about an exchange. Exactly. It wasn't really... Like today, we have a million different things all over the place and yeah. DAOs and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, back then it was it was just an exchange. Yeah, yeah not much things that you could do. Yeah, crypto. not much things that you could yeah. do. Otherwise, this space is very, very wide. Right? Yeah. So so we brainstormed, okay, if you don't want to do action, what else can we do? So we were brainstorming like all the different ideas that we can build in crypto. And one of the ideas that came out as well was to build like Bitcoin mining farms, for example. Yeah. That was also a very obvious idea. And, you know, we could kind of, I mean, some of the biggest companies Bitcoin companies listed these days are Bitcoin miners, yep. publicly listed companies. As in like uh, buying mining hardware? Yeah. Or, like, and doing like, I don't know if there was ASICs back then, I can't remember. Yeah, uh, but like basic, not. maybe maybe the first version of the first ASICs may have just came out. But like, yeah, yeah. basically buying mining hardware, putting them in a warehouse, running those infrastructure. And Here all. in Malaysia, isn't electricity price high? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, you could say that, but you could have to find ways to get industrial rate electricity. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, surprisingly, Malaysia is, I think, the num- one of the top five or top ten Bitcoin miners in the world, actually. Really? Okay. Yeah. 
Um, awesome. So we were thinking about it, but decided not to do that as we had a lot of logistics. Yeah. And then we thought like, let's try to do something that can leverage on our abilities, for example, and TM's a software developer. And we thought like, let's maybe build something like um, like a data site, for example. Websites back then, I don't know if you remember, but they were so horribly designed. Like, yeah. Even though we were in 2013, 2014, like the websites back then were sort of like they were designed in the 1990s. Yeah, it was like, probably like, some kids sort of project on the side yeah. to, to build a really bad website. HTML and like yeah. reminded me of GeoCities days yeah, yeah. and like <laughs> I say I'm sure if we do something and we put up a nice design we could 10x whatever that's out there in the market Yeah, and that's exactly what we did so we kind of put out there and we launched CoinGecko we wanted a way to kind of rank cryptocurrencies mm. beyond market cap so we were tracking like social media stats from Reddit Twitter and so on we read track developer stats on GitHub and try to rank developer activity. Eventually, we kind of changed things up on CoinGecko over the years and realized that people really only want to know about coins by market cap. So we kind yeah. of changed our interface to focus on that. I think that's the classic sort of CoinGecko. When you think of CoinGecko, you think of that front page mm-hmm. with the listings of all of the coins sorted by market cap. Yep. So that wasn't the initial version of CoinGecko. No, no. The oh, initial wow. version had like trading uh, liquidity scores, which kind of takes into account the liquidity on exchanges. It has a developer score, which takes into account how many pull requests, how many commits that a developer does. It has like a social media community score. That was in version one. Yeah, that was version one. That's actually stuff I'd think in version 10 or something. (laughs) So that was in Asia version. If you go to internet archives and kind of look back into 2014, April, May or towards 2014, you will see those scores. I think we only changed that in 2017 or 18, like yeah. after several years. Oh, wow. Okay, so CoinGecko, that's the genesis of it. And then I guess fast forwarding to today or, or maybe what's some of the things which you've seen change over the years, right? Like yeah. from those early beginnings to where you are now, I guess, what have you seen change? And then we can also talk about what you think in the future. Yeah, so I think the big change was when we first started CoinGecko, they were only, I think we had like 50 coins at most. Yes, yeah, there'd be something like that, Yeah. yeah. It was all those mind coins, like feather yeah, coins. Yeah, they're all POW, they proof of work coins. So yeah, yeah. Uh, developer stats was very important because people were pushing code and like into the core, yeah. the Bitcoin core, like QT wallets and so on. So the, yep. the interesting thing that we learned from that was every metric that we track ends up being game. Yep. So that's one of the lessons that like anything that is trackable ends up being manipulated. Yeah. I mean, people do that. Like people try to manipulate market cap, try to manipulate trading volume, exchanges try to do that and like, Basically, any metric that's measured is manipulated. Uh, yeah. People try to find ways to look good, look better. Uh, yeah. People are like, doing one-line commits just to have their developer scores better. People are buying followers on like, yeah. Twitter and Facebook. Um, or the, the fake yeah. volume sort of stuff that yeah. was like the mid-2000 teens, something yeah. like that. So just fighting all those things was kind of a... Takes up a lot of time. I think the big difference was like, yeah, we saw a lot of change in like the kind of coin. So it was like very proof of work. Mm. So like Bitcoin forks, like Litecoin. It was like the narrative back then was Litecoin was an innovative coin because it was a silver to Bitcoin's yeah, gold. Yeah, silver to Bitcoin's <laughs> gold. I remember that. Um, that's that's like faded over the yeah. years now. We don't hear that that often. And then Peer Coin was very innovative because yes. it was the first proof of stake coin. Yep. And. Uh, Namecoin was very interesting because it has like the a decentralized yeah. name services. Yeah. Uh, so those were kind of like the interesting things back then. Obviously, things have changed a lot these days. Things have changed to like layer one, layer two, yeah. like smart contract platform. Ethereum really changed the game with smart contract platform and then everybody tried to be the Ethereum killer, for example, yeah. uh, try to one up. Turns out that everybody just ends up using Ethereum virtual machines and yeah. <laughs> just building on top of it. Yeah. Um, people have like high TPS these days. What is interesting is Ethereum has unlocked a lot of opportunities for people to build on top of this smart contract platform. So instead of developers having to you know run a POW network, mm. having to get miners on your chain, you don't have to worry about the network validation anymore because you're building on Ethereum, riding on top of Ethereum security or one of the L1 security, for example. Yeah. So that's a big difference. Smart contract platform allows a lot of developers to kind of abstract a lot of the basic work in building a chain into like doing like higher level order stuff, like you're just writing a smart contract. I think what we saw is the huge increase in development in DeFi and DAOs in the yeah. last couple of years. So that was one of the things that we rode on in the last couple of years that kind of catapulted CoinGecko to where we are today. Yeah, I think yeah big... there's like a DAO section on CoinGecko now, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And I think the big difference as well is I think we are seeing a lot of shift from trading on centralized exchanges to mm. decentralized exchanges. Good, let's go. Hey, yeah. That's what we want. <laughs> so yeah, that was rather surprising to me because if you ask me like just maybe two years ago, if mm. anybody would be trading on a DEX, and I would say, no way. Like yeah. it's just way too hard, too complex, no one's got time to figure that out. But yeah. I mean, here we are today. I mean, volume's pretty high. I mean, yeah. I think Uniswap had more volume on compared to Coinbase just yeah. a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, yeah. that's a pretty surprising fact. The fact that people kind of use MetaMask and figure it out. And I mean, the first version of DEX that I had in mind was Ether Delta, and obviously yes. that was horrible, very <laughs> unusable. But obviously Uniswap changed the game and made it really simple for people to, to trade on it. So yeah. that's good, right? I mean, the power has shifted from centralized exchanges to decentralized exchanges, and now anybody can you know, create a market and have liquidity pools and have people trading these tokens. Yeah, yeah. So when we're talking about like ease of use, right? Do you think NFTs have changed the game there? Because I guess with the NFT world, they all came at it from self-custody in MetaMask wallets exactly. and Phantom wallets on Solana and stuff like that. So actually, I've heard this as well over the years. It's like, oh, you know, DeFi stuff's too hard to use and this kind of thing. But it's like, wait a minute, all of these NFT people are on these wallets and they're all using this kind of stuff. So do you think um, maybe that's been a breakthrough in, like, yep. we didn't think that everyone would be trading JPEGs and here we are, like, that's yeah. the main sort of the game at the moment. I would say NFTs are a big game changer. Like mm. in the crypto space, it onboarded a whole different set of users who may not necessarily be interested in financial applications. Yeah, A lot of the crypto guys in the early days are libertarians, for example, and they got the financial guys coming in. And then now like you have the artists and the creatives coming in. Yep. You have to give credit to OpenSea for onboarding all these NFT folks and getting them familiar with using MetaMask and running their own wallet, obviously. True. Yeah. A lot of them are not great at security. There's a lot of hacks. They're learning <laughs> it the hard way, but yeah. you have to give credit to OpenSea for enabling decentralized system because once somebody has onboarded some users onto MetaMask, then it's not that hard to get them to learn how to use Uniswap, for example. Yeah. And uh, I think for a lot of cases, they have to wrap their ETH to WETH to make an offer. So you, they have to f probably do it on Uniswap anyway. So yeah. that's definitely a big thing. What's going to be the next catalyst? Because I guess over yep. the years, you've probably seen, you know, certainly from the old days, it was all, as you say, very libertarian people that were in it. We were all talking about crypto payments and paying our bills in Bitcoin. And isn't that wonderful? And then it sort of merged into the smart contract world and all of these other different coins. And it became NFTs and DeFi and blah, blah, blah. What do you think is the future going to look like? Is there any waves that you're seeing or trends or interesting stuff? Or Yeah, I don't know. I'm curious. There's a few things that are interesting. I think NFTs are here to stay. They're mm. not a passing fad. Mm. I think GameFi is definitely very interesting as well. If you ask yourself where will the next billion crypto users come from, like more likely than not, you it will probably come through one of a very addictive game that will, I don't know, Fortnite equivalent in crypto, yeah. for example. Obviously, a lot of games are out there, has a lot of improvement that needs to be done, but well, at some point, like Candy Crush equivalent might show up. And uh, CoinGecko did a lot of stuff with Axie, the Axie community, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. tell us about that. Like, what did you see there in terms of growth or interest or what were people using CoinGecko for with the Axie craze? Yeah, I think for us, Axie was an interesting thing for us. Uh, this was shortly after CryptoKitties, there were very little NFT projects coming out and Axie was one of the early OG NFT projects coming out. We had a chance to meet Jiho and Alex from the team and then we met up with the team in Vietnam because it's pretty close by from where we are. Yeah. And I think kind of formed some sort of a close collaboration, I suppose, kind of helped them onboard some of the early users and then and Axie really took off in 2021, I think, like, we kind of grew and ride along with it. So I think Axie is kind of a very interesting model. They're obviously doing a lot of things with their running network now, trying mm. to be a platform and onboard other game developers onto the blockchain. And mm. I think game development is kind of a hit-based industry where mm. you have like hundreds of games out there, but only one being really popular. And yeah. that's always needed to kind of catapult the industry to the next stage. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it's so hard because not only do you need to build a game, yeah. you need to build an economic system as well and a coin and custody and wallets and blah, blah, blah. And then Axie as well had to build their own chain with mm -hmm. Ronin because you couldn't just put it on top of Ethereum. It was yep. too slow and, and expensive and stuff, right? So yeah, maybe it's different these days, do you think, with building GameFi products? Because there's like, there's so many L1s out there that can do things cheaply and say, hey, we... We can integrate with GameFi and blah, blah, blah. Or do you think 
it's still kind of the same problems. I think there's a lot more options for developers to choose. I mean, mm. you can choose to build on Flow, or you can choose to build on Ronin, or Optimism, or Arbitrum. I mean, like maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. I mean, more headache to decide which tech to choose on. But I think a lot of the challenges of games, it's not really about building a crypto game. I think the, the important bit is how do you make a game addictive, fun, mm. engaging? That's the bigger question. And if you look at the traditional game sector, mm. it's also a hit-based industry. Tencent, for example, invests in like hundreds of game developers. Most of them will fail, but yeah. one or two game studios will make it big and then they will just go all in on those games. Yeah. And, and I mean, Angry Birds founder has a pretty incredible story as well. I think he was trying out and he failed many times. I think on his seventh and last try, he yeah. made it with Angry Bird, but it's always fail, 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 fail. And yeah. that's kind of what we are seeing in the crypto industry right now as well. Most of them are failing, but at some point, somebody's going to make it right and go big. So that's one trend. I think an interesting trend that I'm trying to observe as well is uh, kind of like what Reddit is doing. Mm. So kind of like Web2 companies going into Web3. Mm. So large Web2 companies that have huge following, mm. tapping on their followers base to go into web trees. So I think Reddit has historically been showing a lot of interest in crypto. I think in the early days of Reddit, they wanted to tokenize their equity and give it out to their users as well. They give karma points now, but you can sort of imagine getting Reddit shares, for example. Yeah. Obviously, that, <laughs> that idea was very nice and I bought into the idea, but couldn't implement it due to SEC rules and all, right? Yeah, yeah. So they have like, the NFTs up on Polygon and two of the subreddits have tokens. So the r slash cryptocurrency and r slash Fortnite uh, subreddits have moon and brick tokens. Oh, wow. Okay. I know they, are, they are issued on Arbitrum Nova. Okay. Yeah. I think that's very interesting because the Polygon NFTs that Reddit has been doing has basically, basically any Reddit users on their app has a wallet created already. Yeah. And they have NFT capabilities. They have tokens issued on some of these communities. It's just a matter of time before if they want to build a more better wallet system that allows you to kind of interact with DeFi and so on. So you can kind of interact now, but you cannot import your seed into a MetaMask wallet. Not right, that. yeah, I've always, yeah. I haven't used it. So I've always wondered like, how does it interact from Reddit to yeah. elsewhere? Like, can I send my NFT to another wallet somewhere? Mm, or? So what happens is on your Reddit app, that's like, you can kind of review your private keys, your, mm. your seed phrase, and then you can import that seed phrase onto your MetaMask and mm. then use that MetaMask wallet on your desktop to sell your NFT or move them right. around and so on. In the Reddit app, it's kind of like you can move them around to other Reddit users. So yeah. the complexity of a wallet is abstracted away from Reddit. So I think what Reddit is doing is very interesting because they have basically onboarded 1 million users onto Web3 without anybody knowing them. Like they call NFTs as collectibles, for example. Mm. They call the tokens as, I don't know, karma points or something like that. I'm not so sure what they call it. Exactly. Yeah. But if Reddit is successful, if Reddit managed to build a real world business model out of this experiment that they have, I can foresee a future where the other big Web2 companies kind of FOMO into this. So mm. like, it doesn't have to be big guys like Facebook or Instagram, they kind of shut down their NFT project, but it can, there are many other communities that have large followers. You can imagine so many. Imager, Jiffy, yep. dozens of them out there trying to build something similar. And I think everyone's kind of like watching and seeing. Mm. Everybody wants to be the quick follower, but don't want to be the first guy to make all the mistakes. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. I mean, certainly what you say there about onboarding just a million users really quickly and they don't even know that it exists. I think that totally makes sense. And we were talking as well before, getting back to the data side of CoinGecko, you know, a lot of, I guess, your integrations in the past were more like centralized exchanges, right? Because that was the only game in town. Yep. But now we've got Gecko Terminal, That's right? right? Which is DeFi only and covers pretty much everywhere in DeFi, right? Yeah, so as I said, like one of the big shifts that we saw in crypto was that what used to be a very centralized exchange game has sort of shifted to decentralized exchanges with the rise of Uniswap. So on Why point, do you think that is? I think it's just the breadth of tokens. Like, I mean, Binance is good. They have, I don't know, 400, 500 tokens traded, but you can't compete against Uniswap that has, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of tokens yeah. <laughs> traded. So obviously, most of them are scam yeah. tokens. You have to do your own research and be careful and avoid all the pitfalls. But, but just the freedom of trading whatever tokens that you want yeah. is a big win for Uniswap and DeFi in general. So I would say that's the main thing. You And for many project teams, like, do you want to 
pay, I mean, it was quite common back then to pay like six, seven figures just to get listed on an exchange. Yes. Obviously oh, the, I remember that, yeah. The power 500K has... 500K or something. Exactly. Like, Man. We don't really hear about that so much this day because the power has shifted away from exchanges. I mean, in fact, exchange should pay the tokens to yeah. bring the community to trade on their centralized That's exchange. That's a really good <laughs> observation, actually. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. So nobody talks about six, seven figure listing fees on exchanges because the project say like, I mean, if you're gonna charge seven figures, fine, I take that seven figures and put in a liquidity pool on Uniswap yep. and you know, why should I pay you seven figures? Like yep. I save money and then people can still trade. I just train my community how to trade on Uniswap. So that's a big difference. And so coming back to Gecko Terminal, how kind of things got started, we were observing a lot of trading volume on Binance Smart Chain. A lot of uh, shit coins were created, altcoins, and uh, it was all on PancakeSwap. We were using some third party to kind of index the data, the pricing data provided by PancakeSwap. But because it was fast chain, it was really hard to stay updated. And some of our data were not updating as fast as what the community expects it to be. Mm. And they were giving us a lot of saying we are not accurate and so on. So we had to kind of run our own indexer and kind of ensure we get the right price for BSC fast chains on CoinGecko. So the first version of Gecko Terminal was an API that we built to power CoinGecko. And over time, we put a front end on Gecko Terminal and then added more layer one, layer twos on Gecko Terminal. So what one of the interesting observations that we saw in the past one year was we started with only just Ethereum and BSC, and we've been adding all the layer one, layer two. Most of them are EVM chains. But now we track over 90 blockchain networks. 90, that's a lot. 420 different DEXs. Most of them are Uniswap V2 forks and over 1.3 million tokens. Insane. Yeah. These, these are huge numbers. Like no one in crypto is doing this kind of level of, of yeah. data. I always used to say like anything that can be tokenized will be tokenized and we'll be living in a future where there'll be millions of tokens. Well, that future is here today, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, most of them are questionable tokens. Like CoinGecko lists 11,000 tokens. These are probably tokens with like at the very least some level of yeah. Checks, but on Gecko Terminal, there's like 10x, no 100x more tokens traded, and this is kind of where we are today. If you kind of extrapolate where we will be in the future, we'll probably be looking at a future where there will be billions of tokens. Anything that can be tokenized will be tokenized. Means that your game point, the games that you play, they have all these centralized points. They can be represented as tokens. We start seeing some experiments on this. Your Reddit points are tokenized. Your membership cards can be tokenized, for example. And CoinGecko and Gecko Terminal wants to be that we are trying to build the infrastructure to power this future tokenized The Bloomberg world. of DeFi, <laughs> something like that, right? You can say that. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, wow, so who are the kind of people that are using Gecko Terminal? Because I, yeah. I guess that's another thing is the types of users, we spoke about NFTs before, NFT people, there isn't really that crossover or I'm curious to see your thoughts. Do you think there will be in future if they're going to start using DeFi products? And yep. then we have like, the DGENs and like people that are very financially savvy that are perhaps using DeFi stuff. Like, who are the people that you're looking at for Gecko Terminal? And do you think that'll change over time? Yeah, at this point in time, Gecko Terminal caters more towards uh, more at once traders. Mm. So CoinGecko is more for like, I mean, that's like a mix of users. Some are more sophisticated, some are less. Everyone uses CoinGecko as kind of snapshot get prices, but traders kind of want to see the OHLC chart. They mm -hmm. want to see the last 100 trades, for example, to kind of find who are the large buyers or sellers of a particular token. Yeah. So Gecko Terminal aims to kind of cater to this group of users, people who want to snipe like new tokens that just gets created and then kind of like, okay, I'm just going to YOLO and bet on like, the new liquidity pools and either I'm going to make it and 100x my, yeah. my, my, my money or I'm just going to get rock. Classic. And, and that's a subset of users who don't mind getting rock just to take on that volatility risk of finding 100x, for example. So that's that kind of users. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay, so it's more sort of, I guess, the more DGEN, crypto savvy yeah. kind of people. And do you think that will change over time? Or I guess the question is, all of these centralized exchange users, are they going to come across? Or how do they come across? Because, I mean, we saw FTX blew up, right? And everyone lost their money. And that was a great example to show people like, hey, you should probably not use centralized exchanges. You should probably look at DEXs and these sorts of things. But I don't think we saw this, you know, a massive switch in behavior. So if a blowing up of FTX can't do it, like, can anything do it? I think it will probably come from the pull factor, mm -hmm. like, instead of a push factor like FTX. Mm -hmm. So you may wake up one day and find that your favorite web to web has a token or that maybe there's a new game that was just launched that incorporates crypto, it has a wallet and they have a token that, and the only way to buy this is to kind of use one of these DeFi applications, for example. Mm. 
and then they can't do that on a centralized exchange and they maybe they have to kind of find a way to use DeFi. Or maybe it's not just exchange, there may be certain functionalities that they can't do on a centralized exchange, could be like staking or... Staking or lending or something. Yeah, that forces people to learn how to use a MetaMask wallet. And I think a lot of us kind of got into DeFi because we could get higher yields by all the yield farming games that just weren't available on, yeah. a, on a centralized exchange. I think that observation kind of played out in NFT. Like if you want to buy an NFT, you have to figure out how to use a MetaMask wallet and mm -hmm. hold a CryptoPunks or a BAYC or so on. I think the interesting part about OpenSea was they could have taken on a very centralized approach and kind of custodied all the NFTs, just mm -hmm. like how Coinbase or Binance did for the spot exchange market, but they chose to not bother about that and have the users figure out their own wallet and security. Yeah, yeah. Which was interesting because I guess centralized exchanges tried to get in on the NFT thing, but it just didn't work. And people were kind of like, eh, that's kind of lame. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's because you could just do way more stuff, you know, with a, a DeFi native approach, right? Like whether it's staking or airdropping people coins. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's not as easy for central, because centralized exchanges, you have to like, manually add coins and someone has to review it and blah, blah, blah. Whereas like just deploy a contract and now a thing yeah, exists yeah. and now I can trade it, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So we're getting close to the middle of 2023. What's your priorities, I guess, for CoinGecko this year? We're in a bear market, I guess. And we had things blowing up six months ago. Like, have you seen a difference in, you know, users and that sort of thing? Or what's the future look like for CoinGecko? Yeah, so I thought I would get more free time during this bear market, but it's been surprisingly busy. Yeah. Uh, I think for us, it's just trying to improve CoinGecko, Gecko Terminal, our API product to try to make it the best product and serve our customers well. Definitely one of the observations that I've seen in this last six months is that the Tories are gone. Like those who come for the money have gotten wrecked and left this space. Which is good. <laughs> I'm happy to see that. <laughs> the scammers are gone as well. Um, yeah. At least most of them, I mean, some scammers are hardened and they're still around. But like the core, every time there's the bull market and the bear market, we get a lot of new people coming in and mm. some people leave, but not everybody leave. Mm. Uh, so the, the market definitely grown. The baseline has grown higher compared to where it was in the previous bear cycle. There's a lot of things that we still need to build on to kind of improve the user experience, user functionality for CoinGecko on a web app and the API and Gecko Terminal, for example. And, and that's what we are focused on trying to build. And I think one of the interesting things about crypto is this space doesn't stop innovating. There's always something new. I don't know what is coming up, but yeah. I'm sure there are things that are it's Some random thing will wake up one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then things just get more and more complex. I mean, I come from a day when there was only Bitcoin and POW Fox, and now we have POS. And I mean, we have smart contract platforms, and then we have EVM Fox, and then we have smart contracts like Solana, which is like a whole different beast by itself and many other, and then now we're talking about Aptos, Sui and, and yeah, so yeah. many other things. Like it just gets way complex and like, what do we want to do? What do we focus on? That's the yeah. hard question that we are asking ourselves because can't really say we want to do everything because it's just physically not possible. Mm. So that's true. Picking and choosing our battles is the things that we spend a lot of time trying to, to do and whatever that we want to choose to do, we want to do it the best that we can. And how do you make that decision? Is it based on this is something which the majority of users want, therefore that's what we do? Or is it, I actually think this thing could be in future? And it's kind of like the Henry Ford where he said, if I'd asked people what they want, they would have said faster horses. And yeah. then he went and built a car. So it's kind of like, I guess you have to have the vision to see that, oh, that's something that's going to be big in the future. We should go and focus on building that versus hey, users want a button that, that does X or Y, right? There's no right answer, right? Because, you know, obviously it's always good to look at the data, but the data may not show you what can be trending in the future. But when you go into intuition, then it's like a bet and your bet can be wrong, for mm -hmm. example. And I mean, there's a lot of trends that have turned out to be darts in crypto. We're trying to still figure it out what's best for us. And yeah, just see where things emerge. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would yeah. say that, yeah. No, oh, that's awesome. Well. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, yeah. And I believe you guys have newsletters, you have blogs, there's guides, there's Gecko like Academy or something as well, right? Where we can learn more 
about CoinGecko. So where should we go? Yeah, so follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, yep. or at CoinGecko. If you are kind of new to crypto, like definitely go check out our YouTube, CoinGecko TV. Yep. We just hit 100,000 subscribers. Let's go. Yeah. Nice, congrats. Uh, and yeah, I mean, obviously subscribe to our newsletter at CoinGecko and obviously CoinGecko.com, Gecko Terminal. Uh, and GeckoCon as well is another thing. Yeah, we hosted it for the past two years, uh, probably taking a break this year, yep. and then maybe next year again. Awesome, awesome. We'll go check out. We'll put links down below to everywhere for CoinGecko. But thank you so much for taking the time today, Bobby. It's been a pleasure as always. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is one of the real sort of OG builders in the space. And I am so excited to hear from you, like just the philosophy about why you're building something and making it work. So everyone go check it out. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be back again soon with the next Billion Podcast. Cheers. Cheers.